Hi everyone, my name is Rainy, and uh, on this episode of this course, we are talking about solidarity, particularly in the black community, the black trans community. In, in terms of what freedom and, and what revolution looks like, we have to think beyond what we've always been taught and known. And a lot of the isms that are in our community stem from all the things that we've been raised to believe. People have this misconception that um, that by not doing the wrong thing, you are in fact doing the right thing. When doing nothing is probably just as bad a lot of the time, especially uh, concerning like you know black lives and black trans lives in particular. Um, solidarity needs to be tangible. In order for us to be free, we have to be able to unify. And the things that are keeping us apart aren't, they aren't these unmovable, unchangeable things. I want to hear trans ideas, trans perspective on this thing, um, because I've never sat on a panel like this before. You know, I've never, I've never had these conversations with these kinds of people before. I guess I hope to hear what the cis head men have to say and have the have an opportunity for um, them to kind of be real with me and f for me to be honest. Hey, what's up? My name is Eli, and today I'm talking with these good people here about solidarity with black trans people. Um, this is, this is gonna be a fun uh, conversation to have with y'all. This is something I've been waiting to have like ever since I came out as trans. I've been like, oh, I wanna say it around with this. I don't know, I'm doing that voice. <laughs> I guess that's my pretty voice. I don't know, but I want to sit in a room with cis have men, and I want to have these conversations about what it looks like for them to show up for our people. You know, more specifically, I want to make sure that I highlight that I'm talking about like showing up for Black trans women when we talk about the violence that they face in multiple, you know, facets. So for me, I just want to say this is important to talk about because I am a Black trans person, and it's Black trans everything for me. Like I love y'all, y'all mad cool. This is one of my first times being in a group with people who y'all outnumber me. I'm usually in a group where it's all black trans people. So um, for me, this is important to talk about because I'm in a space with people that have come out their mouth and said, I want to be an ally or I want to be in solidarity with black trans people. So it's very intentional. So I feel like this is such a dope way to get our watchers and listeners to join this with us and find tangible ways for them to support. So I just like to know how y'all feel about this topic and why I guess solidarity is important to you with black trans people. I guess, I'll, uh, no, no, no. Uh, so I guess uh, uh, I won't dwell on anything for too long, but definitely like this this episode, I'm, I'm definitely gonna be doing more more, I'm going to be more on the listening side of things because I, for the same, I guess for similar reasons to Eli, not that I, not that I'm trans, I'm one of the cishet men here, but like for similar reasons, like I've always wanted to sit and listen to a trans people, a, a black trans person's perspective, like in a face to face setting, you know what I mean? Where it's like organic and like, like I'm speaking to a, like a human being that I can relate to and like observe you know what i mean and like actually get the the feeling that like articles and books don't necessarily have you know what i mean because I've, I've read up on this stuff. i try to be like i try to be as open and inclusive and very careful with like what i say and stuff like that and books and articles and stuff help me out but it's never gonna be the same as like being in the room with the person mm -hmm. so it sounds like building community to me yeah because that's what solidarity for me Solidarity means building community. It means like you're not just picking our brains, you know. Like exactly. we're in community. We do people's hair. We babysit. We're, yeah. we're nephews. We're nieces. We're nibblings. We're uncles. We're aunties. You know. Yeah. Not for nothing. People may not recognize how they 
interact with trans people, but everybody straight up and down has interacted with a trans person. Whether you knew it or not, you have in some facet of the way. So I really do appreciate you bringing that up. Thank you. Yeah, I'll say it's important to me just as someone that's claiming to be out here pushing like a black radical policy and talking about black liberation and black power that has to encompass like all black people, you know, all of us, none of us. Uh, so yeah, that's why that shit's important. Right. That's dope, because a lot of times it's just that black dudes be like, put your black first. Like, as if I don't walk into the room <laughs> and I can, like, hang my trans and turn my parents <laughs> on the door and be like, yo, I'm just black today, guys. Like, don't see me or read me as a gender. Don't read anything else. Just read my blackness. So I really do appreciate you bringing that forward. All black. All black. Yeah, and I feel like when I think about revolution, it's like, it's all of us or none of us. You feel me? So, like, one of the biggest things I was excited about about being in this show is like being here and being able to build community. You feel me? Because there's no telling like what community can build from that. You feel me? It's like now I know more about you. It's like, oh yeah, we've followed each other online, but like I know what you do. You feel me? So it's like, all right, you can tap in with me, you feel me, and vice versa. I'm like, how can I actually support the work that you're doing right now? Because I think that's what it is and like using, you know, my privilege as a black straight man, you feel me, to like have these conversations as well, not just here, but outside of these spaces, you feel me, where I can help educate my poppers, you know, and challenge their transphobia. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's why I'm excited for this conversation. It's kind of interesting you bring up privilege in this way because for me, when I think about being like a black trans person that's ascribed masculine or whatever, you know, one time I was at a bar for Stonewall, it was either Trans Day of Visibility or Trans Day of one of them days, and um, there was an event and it was white TGNC, that's transgender non-conforming people. It was more white people in the room and they was doing something on stage that made me feel uncomfortable. And in the moment, I was like, yo, I told my bro, who's also a trans, trans man, trans masculine person, I'm like, yo, you know, if one of the girls was here, they would just go up on stage and take the mic and shut it down. I was like, bro, I really, I'm like, why am I so hesitant to do? Like, we're literally unpacking this in the middle of the party and I'm like, like, I know what they're doing is not right. And I, I feel the power that the girls have when they come in the room, but what's holding me back. And later on, I was, I was happy to talk with more trans masculine people that said, there's a reality that the way masculinity is set up, if we would have went up there and took the mic and did this thing, it shows up different than if one of the girls were to go up. And so, so for me, that brings into the conversation, like, how does it impact you personally as somebody who is trying to be in solidarity and also recognize like you don't want to overstep you know what i'm saying like you want to uplift but you don't want to take the mic and speak for so like how does it impact y'all personally when you find yourself wanting to be in solidarity it's not easy um i guess from my perspective of like the work that i do as a writer um, or a journalist or however you want to call it i'm oftentimes asked to write for every letter in the acronym so, you know, if I identify as queer, that means I can write about the L, the G, the B, the T, the P, the K. Like, oh, you can do all of it, right? And so it then becomes a thing of where you're taking up space that someone else should be um, occupying. But the, there's also another side to that where sometimes if I say, well, no, I'm not the person um, to talk about this. You should talk to this person or that person. They kill the whole story. And so I have to make that decision often of do I tell or write this story or cover this story about um, trans people and take the heat uh, that I may get from my own community for potentially taking up space or do I say I can't do this, you should go with this person or that person knowing they're potentially going to kill the story because part of it was you got a platform and we're buying into your platform, not just the fact that you could potentially write about this story, but you also have this vehicle to get our story out there to and a lot of people. And palatable. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. That these other people you're suggesting, mm-hmm. suggesting don't have, right? Mm-hmm. It, because again, a lot of times in media, it's not about the truth of the story. It's about getting the story first mm-hmm. and getting it out to the most people and using a person who already has a lot of following to get that story out to the most people. So it's not like they're intentionally caring about the people who are they're talking about in the mm-hmm. story as much as this is a story that needs to be told and it needs to um, 
get out there. Mm -hmm. So there are times where I have to sit and figure that out. But what I will say is I'm, I appreciate being called in, mm -hmm. called out or called in. So I don't, I'm not bothered in a way that some people find it triggering, right? Because a lot of people say, oh, that's just an excuse. And it's like, yeah, it, it, it is, right? Like, because I do understand like the storytelling aspect is, is important, but it's just as important as the taking up space aspect. So it's just learning how to balance that um, and how to, I guess, fight harder to create spaces where that doesn't have to be what we're making a decision between. Because mm -hmm. the problem is that we even have to make a decision in how we show up for people. And so how do we start to create spaces and create um, our own systems to where we don't have to make that decision of how I have to show up mm -hmm. for um, a trans person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I also want to, like I hate the word ally. Yeah. And so I'm <laughs> glad we're using the word solidarity yeah. because like even when you look at the definition of ally, it says mutual benefit. And when you're, from what I feel is when I'm trying to help trans people, I'm not looking for something mutually to be gained from it. Right. And so I don't call myself like a, a transgender ally. Mm -hmm. like I would say I'm an advocate, right. um, or I would say I'm, I'm in solidarity with trans people, right. but I'm not an ally because I don't. There's nothing mutual that I'm expecting to happen. Like, oh, I did this for you, you need to do this for me. Right. Um, so I just want to put that out there too. Right. I think one point that you made that I'm so glad you brought it up um, was the point of like um, not overstepping that boundary and what it looks like to make space for trans people. And knowing that there's a reality that, in in theory, it sounds good, right? In theory, George gets somebody from a major publication, and you know a black trans woman that can write on this way, um, way more knowledgeable about this, right? From a place of experience and you know study knowledge, and you be like, yo, hit up X Y Z, and then you hit her up, and you be like, yo, sis, this also hit you up, and they be like, no, everything cuts time. So that makes me think of Black Trans Travel Fund that I helped my boy do. Um, it's here in New York City um, and also New Jersey. And it's pretty much a fund where it's strictly donation based and we get donations and we send the girls money to help get rides because we already know like, even as black men, you know what it gives on the subway, you know what it gives with traveling. So it's to help them self-determine a safer option. So it makes me think of that because that's run by black trans men. And then pretty much like, we just added black trans women onto the team, but it was mostly like black trans men, black trans masculine people. And I know my man's getting like annoyed with me, how I bring it to the table, but I've been making him get real intentional about thinking about why he's been able to do this while the girls have been asking for money for themselves for all this time and people will not directly give them money. But people will give us money to disperse to them. And I had to sit down and be like, we gotta, like this is, as trans men or whatever, we gotta unpack this shit, this is patriarchy that allows us to be in a position to say, hey, let's get money for this. And yo, people from TV shows are hitting him up and writing him checks for the fun that like, we literally are in community with black trans women that's been doing this. And we're telling them, cause we're transparent and they're like, yo, I've been doing this for a decade. They never hit me up to write me nothing. So I, I asked him, I'm like, bro, I know he gets annoyed, and this is not to take away from the success, right? Because this is us being in solidarity with them. But I ask him, yo, what does it look like when we start getting big checks to say, why do we need $10,000 just for rides when we know the girls need housing? So what does it mean to take a portion of that and be like, to the funders, a point that I made to Randy a few times, like having that power, we can ask. We can say, so you about to give us 10 stacks. Can you match that to the girls that they need money? Or, so you say no, so we're gonna take five of that, we're gonna take that for us and we're gonna give the other five to them. Leveraging that power, you know what I'm saying? Like leveraging that that power. So do any of y'all have that experience kind of like how George said, where you're in a position to kind of like, you know, like leverage that power and you see how it impacts other, whether, whether it's in a way like we said, where you see it gets cut short. So like, okay, what's next? Like I did what I was supposed to do, or you see that, oh wow, I'm getting all this attention for doing this. How do I give it back to the girls? Anybody? Yeah, um, I think, so, I forgot what year it was, and not to like, not to plug anything or whatever, but I'm part of this like, 
group of like musicians and producers and stuff. And like every every so often we drop a, uh, a tape. Mm -hmm. And the first tape we ever dropped uh, was on Bandcamp, strictly donation based. And we donated all the proceeds to the Trans Law Center, yes. right? And like that was okay with me mm -hmm. at the time. But like I guess maybe this is like you know from all the unpacking we've done thus far. Looking back now, maybe it's selfish of me to think this, but like the what the money we raised ultimately like this goes to another issue of like what do what are big what are big donation based corporations really doing mm. and like how is that tangible because I didn't see anything happen from that right but when me personally I Apple paid my trans friend to get like a hair and nails done and to do all that shit like. Yeah. When I do that, I see that, right. and like she's happy, right. and like she's like she's like, oh, you pay, you pick the color, like like it was fun, it was right. like so I made a tangible difference in somebody's life, mm -hmm. as opposed to like just like giving it off, like handing it off to this big corporation to do, I don't know what with. Right. So that was my, so I'm of the belief that like you like like what not to take away from what y'all are doing with the trans travel fund but like me for me personally like i'd rather just connect with like a black trans woman or a black trans man or whatever and like strictly just be like how much you need you know what i mean it's funny you say that though because the reason we talk about the strategy the reason black trans travel fund has been so successful is because of that that need you just named it we were like, yo, why is this so successful? Because people want to feel like, it's a very selfish thing, yeah. people want to feel like I did something. So for us to have this thing where once a month we're like, yeah, we had a thousand people uh, apply, 10% of them were cis at people trying to get money from the girls, because <laughs> it's a thing that happens. <laughs> and, then, and then it's like, and then we gave away $500. People who donated, whether they donated anonymously or not, that makes them feel good, you know? So. When I think about that, I think about something that's important to me is material support. Yeah. You know, providing very tangible material support. I think I said it in another episode, I say it again, if you spend $5,000 a year betting on sports, you literally can dial back, because you probably want a little something if you bet 5000 You probably yeah, yeah, yeah. came up a little bit or something. <laughs> You're doing it right. You understand? <laughs> so if you can afford to just throw away 500 like that, why not take Five thousand. Why not take five hundred of that and do what you're doing? Like that for me is an example that I wanted to give people of tangible support because it's material support. Because when we talk about community organizing, it's about survival. Right. I think a point that you made that should for sure be addressed is like I don't know something around like I guess like privilege in terms of solidarity, especially being like cishead men. I feel like the bar is the floor for us. Mm -hmm. Like, and that's something that got to be named and be, and be like consistently on the forefront of our brains. Like, why are we doing this shit and how are we doing this shit? Because, like, if I boost, like, there, there is power that comes with solidarity for cishead men with the bar being the full. Like, you can recognize as if you're doing this great ass work, but really, niggas is on average doing the bare minimum. Yes. Like, that's just something that got to be said. We got to keep it at the forefront of our brains. So, that's something I think about consistently when I move the way that I move. Uh, and I just think about, I think we talked about it on a, on a previous episode around like around white folks and them doing the, the necessary labor to like educate their people. Mm -hmm. So I think about in terms of how I move through solidarity. Sometimes thinking about the space that I'm in, mm -hmm. uh, cause we both know like right, I would never, I would try my best not to put a trans woman in a room for the cis head man and have her sitting there advocating for herself. Mm -hmm. That's really dangerous. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I think if, if that, just navigating the spaces that I'm in, and it's like it takes a conscious effort. Like you got to be thinking about this shit consistently, but that's what's required to be, uh, I don't know if it's like a worthy, whatever, but like mm -hmm. a, a decent ally, you know what I'm right. saying? So right. I think about like, in terms of solidarity for me uh, and trying not to take up too much space, I constantly think about where I am, like mm -hmm. who I'm talking to, right? Mm -hmm. like, there's no point if like, let's say if it's on Twitter, if a trans woman is saying something, there's no need for me to like, I try not to like, quote, tweet her shit, like mm -hmm. just retweet it, as opposed to like, you know, speaking over or something mm -hmm. like that, All right? So I was just like, navigating the spaces that you are in mm -hmm. is a way that you can just make sure, you know, you being an ally, or you are in solidarity as opposed mm -hmm. to like, speaking over motherfuckers or for people. Yeah, most definitely. Um, you know, this topic is mad personal for me. Um, because like I said, I've been wanting to sit in a room and do this with guys forever. So it just makes me think of like, every facet from like, Julius, I think about porn. You get what I'm saying? Like straight up, I think about like, like that whole industry and like what it would look like for you. 
you or what it does like I don't know what you do you know what I'm saying like what it does look like for you like how does it impact what you do like it, do you have interaction with in the in the industry that you're in with with trans people period um, actually last year I got called out at a, uh, a convention by like a huge trans celebrity mm -hmm. it was like a black farm matters panel and he just stood up and was like y'all don't have any trans people in black farm matters mm -hmm. and I was like uh, fuck mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying mm -hmm. but we don't mm -hmm. nor do we even look for them mm -hmm. you know what I mean um, but I also don't know who the influencer are. Like, who are the leaders of this community? Because I don't, I, I haven't read <laughs> <laughs> I don't have seen like, any representations until someone dies. And mm -hmm. they're here about what Trump did. And I think that was my first uh, interactions with anything that was outside of playing basketball. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Was in Detroit, guys, like, it's a, it's a thing to go downtown and be a, trans people, you know what I mean? Like they'll get in the car 10 people deep and just find somebody with longer hair. You know what I'm saying? That feeds that image or whatever right. perception of trans and gender not conforming. Right. right. And then getting older and then listening to podcasts, um, most of the true crime stuff I listen to, serial killers always start with black trans women. You know, and then they graduate to black women mm -hmm. and then they kill the first white woman and then they get caught. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of instances where that happens. Mm -hmm. And then I guess the only positive trans interaction I had was at a, uh, a gay bar in, uh, in Vegas called Piranha. And they do like a drag race at 1 a.m. or whatever. And that was the greatest strip performance I've ever seen in my life. I was like, strippers have nothing on this show. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. She didn't take her clothes off, but she collected way more money Sex than I've seen. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but that's my only experiences with it. Because if even if I saw a trans man, he's not in drag, so I don't feel appropriate like right, right, approaching right. him because he's not in his thing. Right, 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 right. I think for me, what you brought up was something very, again, this is personal. So like to even bring up like the heinous crimes that like um, trans women face. And like, when I say this, this is not a personal attack on any cishet man because I can't like assume that you murdered a, you know, like a trans woman. However, more times than not, the ones that do these crimes are cishet men. Yeah. You know, like we bring up Islam Nettles, like in her name, like she literally was beat to death, excuse me, outside of a precinct in New York City by a group of dudes who, 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 who one, found her attractive and then turned around and once his mans in them realized you know, what her T was, is what we call it, they went and got violent. So for me, it brings up this thing where we talk about how it impacts those around you. You know, I already said it, you're in community with trans people already. Whether you know it or not, you're in community with them. So like, when you think about how it impacts those around you, I, I guess I want to pose the question like, like, what does it look like to show up in, in tangible ways that are not I guess so to say like performative. Like I'm, I'm thinking about like the barbershop. Yeah. I'm thinking about like conversations with your man's name. I'm thinking about little stuff that you see. Like what what are some ways maybe you, I don't know if you want to let us know, like what are some ways you think maybe you you think you can help like impact the 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 solidarity as far as lessening the harm? Yeah, I think that um, it it really is the small stuff in a lot of ways. Um, and it doesn't have to be as dramatic as a lot of people think it is. Like in a similar way, I think I talked about like street harassment and how to deal with street harassment. It's, it's, it's sort of similar because something I've noticed is that cishet men talk about trans women a lot. I don't know if y'all have noticed this, but I've noticed this. And really straight men, just really just them. It's really fascinating. It, it comes up so much. Like I, at the one of my former jobs years ago that I had, it felt like it came up every day. And it was just a, a, a group of men in close proximity for hours and I couldn't leave. And just trans women came up every single day. And it got to a point, I was just like, okay, why are we talking about this every day? Mm -hmm. do, you, do you want to date one of them? Mm -hmm. is it, what is going on? And um, so there's so many opportunities to say something is my point, mm -hmm. you know? And in those moments, 
it could be a, um, you could just say the small things to show that, that that's not cool with you. Even mm -hmm. if it's like, yo, chill, that's really bad. Like, whatever. Mm -hmm. Or just like, why are mm -hmm. we talking about this all the time? Mm -hmm. Or just like, oh no, or even though, why do you care? I love a well-placed, why do you care? Because that really just turns it right back on them. And if you really want to, want to push the issue no but really why the fuck do you care mm -hmm. and just make them talk about it mm -hmm. and just like that there either they'll shut the fuck up around you which you know you did something you showed them at least this space is not okay and that it shows them they could get shut down potentially by anyone because mm -hmm. if their homeboy can shut down can shut them down who else can mm -hmm. and it also shows them that it's wrong mm -hmm. because like we're kind of taught that that Hope, like homophobia and transphobia is okay and mm -hmm. that is a sign of like your masculinity mm -hmm. to say those things it reinforces your shit but if someone that you respect shows you that, that it's not cool you know you're going to slow that down right. and also on the positive end not just shutting down your homeboys but also showing support in front of them like when if you see a trans woman on the street getting hassled Maybe the same way for street harassment, walk her to the train, get her a, 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 a cab home, make sure she gets to flee the area safely. Or if something comes up on TV and your homeboy says something and you're like, oh, I don't really, what's that show? Oh no, that show's popping, I think I did it. Like admit, claim things, you know? And both the positive and the negatives mm -hmm. show solidarity. It makes me think of like you good sis. Like you see like somebody that you read as as a black trans, what whatever it may have you, or even just like queer, whatever, and you like, yo, you good? That way you give them autonomy to even say if they need the help. Because yeah. some of the girls will be like, I got this, you know, like whatever, because whatever thing. And then, and then some will be like, you know what I'm saying? Like, come, you know what I'm saying? Come give me a little hand here. That would be nice. Like, and also we got to be real that this is going to be new, right? So let's say that this get this gets solidarity catches on in the way that we want it to catch on. I want the impact of this to be that dudes is out there showing up. You know, when we talk about violence, no shade, this is the time that I'm like, this is the time to knock niggas out. This is the time. If it gets, if you're you gonna go come, here, come straight up, if you're gonna come and knock somebody out, this is the time. Because at the end of the day, for me, as like a trans masculine person, trans person, like sometimes it feels like cishet men only speak violence on certain terms. Like sometimes it feels like, oh, okay, so you're fluent in violence, let's speak violence then, my nigga. So w when I think about solidarity, and when I think about Hold like- on, Before you move yeah, on, no, like, please. We, we can't just like, like, <sighs> gay men are terrible. Like, yeah, they come, get me, get also me. terrible. Like, I know we get in the cis heads together, but right. if we go to really talk about solidarity, we have to talk about the issue that we have with black gay men and, and trans, trans, women. trans women. Like, that's also something that is, it is something that I don't understand. Right. I have never been able to figure out how, why we got there. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. So, yeah. so when the Black Trans Travel Fund came up, it's no mm -hmm. shade. It was made by an openly black right. trans man. My question was, all these butch queens that be in the girls' faces, why yeah, does this exist yeah. already? So, and so like, part of it is like, on an individual level, what are you doing for trans people, right? So one of the things I try to do is I try to like, it was going once a month until I just couldn't keep up with everything. But what I was doing was like giving free uh, lunch mm -hmm. to, to trans people only. Like, and it was like, if you DM me your name, I'll pay for lunch for you today mm -hmm. for 20 trans people. And people were tagging people, I'm like, George, that's so cool. It's like, well, from what I'm learning from trans people, it's like, it's about the, the micro things that you do in their day-to-day -day life. Yes. Um, it doesn't have to always just be a statement when they are, are killed, yes. which you brought up, because that's so true. Like, we hear about their death, but we don't hear about their lives, right? right? Um, but I, I'm, it brings me back to, um, I can't remember her name, uh, who died at Rikers Island. Oh, um, uh, Lady, Lady, Lady Polanco. Polanco, and I went to the rally. Mm. Um, and to go to the rally and have people thank me for showing up really, not only bothered me, but it really changed my lens on 
just how poorly people who are male presenting and black the bar. show up for for trans people. And I mean, by that time, I mean, I have followers, so like, you know, but I think for them it was like, we don't even have an expectation for y'all to show up for mm -hmm. us. So like when we see one of y'all who is a vocal person, or we just see one of y'all, it's like a thank you because that's, you know, maybe the last time we had a rally, only five of y'all showed up, but this rally, eight of y'all showed yes. us, right? And it's so sad though, that solidarity looks like where we're being thanked by the victim. Yes. For showing up for them. Yeah, and for doing the bare minimum. Like. And they're doing the bare minimum, because I didn't do anything, I just came to support. Malik Yoba. And, like, I was just, <laughs> I literally <laughs> like Malik Yoba. Uh, uh, can I? I just wanna go. <laughs> Solidarity isn't wanting to fuck them. I just really wanna <laughs> throw that out there. Real quick. Just throw it out here. But wanting to fuck them is not the same thing as solidarity. Take take the microphone, put the microphone down. Put it down, it's not for you. I just I can't all these interviews mm -hmm. and all these opportunities to speak. And it's like, shut the fuck up. Just yeah, like, because yeah. I also want to say too, it's like, I just noticed this trend of every single cis guy that goes out there and says that he is trans attracted has a very long history of pursuing young trans people. Ooh. Usually before they start transitioning or early in their transitions, mm. when they're the most like vulnerable mm. and they swoop right in because, you know, as a community, what do we do with our trans and queer youth? We throw them away. Let's be really honest. And then all these old white men and all of these, you know, older cis black men mm -hmm. come along and they snatch up the, the, um, the youth mm -hmm. when they don't have community around them. Mm -hmm. That's another thing about solidarity. If y'all have skills with children and without passing them any of the awful like socialization stuff, without being transphobic and homophobic, but if you have a gift with kids, Take on some of these uh, queer and trans youth then. Because mm. that's solidarity, that's building community right there. They need community. Mm -hmm. Put in some um, some hours volunteering. Give, give people who are trying to um, um, like live and survive, give them that material support without having sex with them. I really just want to highlight, because you know, some of these heads of these nonprofits or mm. some of these, you know, some of these so some of these people really don't know how to do research or provide support without having sex yes. with the people. And as men, I just want to throw it out there, you don't have to fuck everything you're trying to help. Mm. Just want to throw it out there. And for the community, marginalized people don't need to accept help from just anybody. Mm. I know shit is rough out there and shit is scarce, but Really, people need to question why somebody's come in to help and maybe vet instead of getting excited with every cis head guy mm -hmm. that says he wants to be in solidarity. Mm -hmm. Hold that man at arm's length and just look at him. Make him earn the right to be in solidarity with you. That's, That's like, yeah. I really appreciate that because that really brings me to like my next question where I ask like how we contribute to the issue of lack of solidarity or rather just whatever it may, you know, have you to like the violence black trans people, more specific black trans black trans women um, may face. And I think um, one thing you said, it brought me to this idea of Malik Yoba and rest in peace Reese. Like I can see Reese as a whole entire human being. If you don't know who Reese is, Reese is a, a black man who had faith tatted on his forehead and he passed away. And when he passed away, the story was just so construed that we don't have time to go into it. But he was yet again another, what we'd assume, cishet black man that came forward. And there was a video of him getting bullied for loving his girl. And that's the video we saw. That's the video. So for me, it was just, I had to recognize how I contribute to this where, and this is like me for the first time even sharing this, like my girl, Aya Simone, has always like, like put this in me and just reiterate this whenever this comes up is you know cishet men and we'll take it further because I don't want to let any like transphobia slip in men period no matter how they identify on the cis or trans whatever you know men get platforms for loving trans women the only ones that get platforms you don't think women love trans women too plenty of women they're lesbians too right but men get platforms for loving 
black trans women. Like you said, that's my solidarity, yeah, right? They, 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 no, sorry, no, 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 no. It's funny, like, what was the Breakfast Club interview? Like, when you just said that? Nala was on it. Which one? Because they had a lot. It was like, it was the, oh, man. I Not the one with Star. With who? With the comedian? The comedian? No, no, no. It, the, the, with Malik Yoba. I, the most recent one. Yeah, I did. It was one, it was one where, like, you know, like you said, like, men are literally are the only people that get a platform for loving trans people. Mm -hmm. And then don't use that platform at all to uplift the trans people they No love. material support. You know what I mean? Yeah, so like the whole the whole interview, the whole time I was watching it, it was the the mic was on the man. And even though he had three trans Oh no, he had two. It was Nala and I think Carmen. I think was I think two? I know I think I know exactly you know what you're talking about. It was I think it was the most recent one. Malik. Okay, yeah. Nala was on there and Carmen yeah, was on there. Yeah, so I watched that and I'm like I'm a, I'm gonna be real. I was a little toxic. I was like, let's see how Charlemagne handled this shit right here. You know what I mean? Like I was like, I just kind of folded my my arms and my legs. And I was like, let's see how this shit play out. Like, right. and like because like I I wanted like insight from like the cis head perspective. Like whenever this kind of shit pop up, I try to like watch or whatever mm -hmm. for whatever reason. But like literally the whole time, like it's it's really just like, oh wow, you're so great. Wow, you love us. Thank you so much. And it's like. You didn't give the you didn't pass the mic up like once, and I like I skimmed through the like you know how you skip through the video. Yeah. Literally every timestamp is just him talking. But did you peep out? It was kind of like The Bachelor. Like yeah. I don't know if anybody listened to it, but he kind of was positioning himself to. It goes back to that point of Pierre to lure more of the girls yeah. in. It wasn't about what he's about. He, like he was given like I'm that nigga. Yeah. I like the girls. And I can't say it because I'm not allowed to say it, but I like sucking tea, girl, you know, and I'm here for that, and I let the girls know, and I'm here for that, and that's all that matters. And he wasn't at no point, like, not for nothing, yeah, he's a washed up actor, but bro, you got some points. Yeah, bro. for sure. Because there's a person that I let them remain anonymous, they donated to a black trans led org, right? And in donating to that black trans org, they're allowing housing for black trans women and it's a mutual support. So when I think about this person who's not as big a name as him, I think about us and what we could do in this room. I think about our salaries, straight up and down. Yeah. Between us, we could come up with $10,000 for the year. No shade, it may sound like a lot at first, but if we sit down and crunch numbers, we could come up with $10,000 for the year and we can give money to black trans women to pay their shit. So when I think about like what solidarity is, I think about like the tangible support and I'll run that into the ground. So this has been such a great conversation with y'all. And I guess when we talk about solidarity with black trans people, I guess it's time to get to the nitty gritty. Like how do you contribute to transphobia? Yeah. I think for myself, I was definitely, like, I try to be as solid as best I can, but at the same time, there's been times where I've, I've been trash. You feel me? Especially, like, growing up, I feel like I was socialized in a very hyper masculine environment, playing two of the most violent sports, in, you know, growing up, up football and rugby, like, playing these sports where in the locker room, the slurs are just being used constantly. And that's part of like, quote unquote manhood, or like, that's being tough, just putting down someone else. Like, so that was definitely something that I was a part of growing up, you know, in grade school, you feel me? Just like, early on in high school, that was just a lot, a lot of slurs was being used. Um, but I feel like once I, I got to, to college, I was able to, and I, I was also silent too, in times where I could check shit, you feel me? And then, like in college, Getting started and getting organizing, I remember um, my friend, she kept saying they referring to the partner. And I was like, what does is, what is that mean? Like, I was just, I did not know. Like, they keep saying they, like, what does it mean? Oh, I'm talking about my partner, but gender queer. I was like, okay, what's gender queer? Mean? And for me, that was like, that was a pivotal moment where I was like, all right, I need to learn. Like, because I obviously, I don't, I have no idea. Like, and everyone was like, almost like fluent in the way they were talking. So I need to learn. You feel me? And like, I need to check the way that I was growing up. You feel me? And then, like, also, I, um, playing rugby, I had a, a teammate who came out as gay. Mm -hmm. And I remember just, like, on the rugby team, it was just hella homophobia. And I'm like, all right, I remember talking to him. We had the same, the same name, um, mm -hmm. Blake. <laughs> I was like, how could, like, I'm 
all this shit has happened, like, what can I do? You feel me? I want to let you know I support you. You know what I mean? Um, and I feel like that was, like, the time of, like, growth. You feel me? And, like, how do I grow? How do I learn? And I think that was for me, like, checking, like, yeah, I've been homophobic before. I've been transphobic before. And I have to admit that. Mm-hmm. If I'm going to be honest about being in solidarity, and, like, I think I want to say that to, like, people who are listening who might be a black, straight, cis, hey, you feel me? Like, you can, you have been this way before, but how do you grow? How do you address that shit, you feel me? No, yeah. And I think that's super important. So I think moving on from, like, being tangible is, like, I think it's important for me um, to be very clear with my politics are, okay. right? And being very clear, like, transphobia, this is trash, this should not be existing, right? Homophobia, you feel me? Like, so I think being very clear on my platform that I have and being clear on the podcast, like, and not just on me talking about it and us talking about it on the podcast, but also, like, how do we pass that mic? Right. You feel me? How do we pay our guests? Right. And shit like that. So I think that's super important. And even when we're talking about revolution, like that shit has to be material. You feel me? Right. Like I think that's a what we the common theme that is coming up, you know, so with people's breakfast oh, when we organize around black houses folks and a lot of the black houses folks that we see are trans, black trans folks. You feel me? So like uplifting them, you feel me, and supporting them materially. But also realizing, like, in PBO, we need to do better as well. Like, because we're organizing around black castle folks, and of course, black trans folks are experiencing this too. Mm-hmm. But, like, what specifically can we do as PBO mm-hmm. to, like, be directly doing something? Like, mm-hmm. a direct initiative for black trans people in Oakland or nationally, you feel me? Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like that's one thing I got from this conversation. Like, damn, like, We've been saying it before, but like now it's like, damn. It's I'm like, niggas ain't doing enough. For me. Yeah, Actually, doing enough, like, and then people will praise us as like, oh, we're allies. I'm like, we're doing very bare minimum by speaking about transphobia. Right. Like that is the point that we're speaking about it. Yes. And that theory, right? Like, but like, what is that actual tangible action? Right. That solidarity, that material, because we know white supremacist, capitalist, patriarchy that we're talking about. We're is it's a material condition. Right. And there's a reason why we see a lot of black trans homeless folks. Right. You feel me? It's because of transphobia and capitalism right. intersecting at that same time. Right. Right. Transphobia comes from white supremacy. And that just makes me want to go back to like George, when you were talking about like gay men and transphobia, would you mind kind of like going a little bit into detail what you mean, like how maybe even you or like what you've witnessed have kind of influenced transphobia or fed into it? Um, it's interesting because again, like I grew up with transgender people in my family. Um, so I didn't really have a lens like everyone else of like being introduced to trans people in the world because my world existed with them. But I do remember like from a young age, like not wanting to be seen publicly with my cousin um, because I was 16 or 17 and I was struggling with what I was and couldn't even figure out what I was yet. And it was like, but I also don't even have the capacity to take on the burden of what you are, that you know you are, even though you're taking on the capacity of me, not knowing what I am, you're taking on the capacity of wanting to be there for me every step of the way, because you know what I am, you know what I'm about to go through. And I didn't even have the, um, the strength or the, the courage to want to stand side by side with you. Um, and, but I think about how long it took me to get to a place of wanting to stand side by side with trans people. Um, there was just like this fear, like of what will people think about me if I'm standing next to them? Mm. What will people think about me if I'm in the same space with them or I'm friends with them? Or it was a very personal thing. And so I think a lot of us contribute to transphobia because we get stuck in the personal aspect of how it will harm our own lives and we don't think about um, the harm we're doing to other people's lives when we don't invite them in and we also don't make them a part of our normalcy and we don't make them a part of what our actual community is supposed to look like because our actual community is supposed to look like me and them being friends. Mm-hmm. Why on earth would that matter? Why, why would that be a bad thing that I could be friends with a black person, a black trans person, or a, a good, it's a black person who is different from than I am, mm-hmm. right? Like, and how, how have we gone this long with liberation models that aren't set up with black people in the same room with other black people, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? The asterisk model. Like, right, yeah. right? And so um, 
like I said, and even to this day, I'm sure, like, I will always, and I think that's another thing, too, right? It's like realizing that because we aren't trans, we're always going to contribute to trans folk, right? Like, even as a trans, I just want to, and even as a trans person, I yeah, right? <laughs> and so it's like, it, it's almost like, you know, the, the, the woke white woman, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like, even if you're the wokest white person in the world, you're still going to inherently benefit from racism. Right, and you're you're going to do things that feed into racism and capitalism and the other systems that shut other people down. No matter how good of a white person you are, so I think about that in terms of um, gay men. Um, well, obviously, and then I'm going to that point. But gay men who get it, and just other queer people who get it, like we're still going to contribute to transphobia. So it's about how do I reduce the amount of harm or reduce to the, the most infinitesimal. Mm-hmm. of the harm that I'm placing on that community because I know I'm still going to benefit from people being transphobic. Mm-hmm. Times where I know it because I can see it and a lot of times where because I don't see it um, and I miss it mm-hmm. and I'm going to miss it and so I think um, then it becomes like when you're called out about it, how do you react mm-hmm. to it? Right? Do you take it in? Do you actually listen to it? Do you actually um, start to make tangible changes when a trans person is telling you something? Or do you feel personally attacked? Right. Right? Because like your advocacy can't look like only when it's good. And only when everybody agrees with you. Right. Right. Because there were times, and I think you brought up a situation with Reese, yeah. that was a time where a lot of, I would say like gay or non-trans people got it wrong. Right, because it, but it was hard. It was a very hard conversation that we had to have around the protection of a cis man, life of, right, yeah. the protector over the life of the actual trans person that they were in a relationship with, who was also being harmed by this cis head man. Yeah. Right, so it was like, wow. Like, but it brought up a very, I think, interesting conversation between those two. Uh, we, well, it wasn't just two, but I'd say multiple black right. communities around how we have to start to navigate um, spaces around harm, and spaces around trans people, and spaces around um, black community uh, in that way. Uh, when we talk about gay men, <laughs> I don't know. It's like I, I still can't figure it out. Like I don't know what the beef is. Like. Sometimes I feel like it's the same thing that we deal with with like straight men. Straight men maybe don't feel as liberated. And so I think there are times where gay men look at trans people as like the ultimate pinnacle of liberation in a sense. And they can't get to that because they own internalized shit. So they didn't use it and weaponize it against trans people. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think there's that. I also think just because you are a gay man doesn't mean that you are not still a man right. and because you are a man you're conditioned to hate women right. in many instances they are trans women they are women mm-hmm. so that misogyny feeds directly into your gayness as a man and then you hate women right and so holy oh, shit <laughs> God damn. and so you have this other added layer and dynamic because, and it's funny because you say holy shit, but it's because black heterosexual men don't see us as black male presenting as um, That's men. So because you don't see that, you don't even think that, oh wait, you were conditioned to be the same way as I, because I don't necessarily yeah. see you as a man, right? Because, no, it's a, no, 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 I mean, yeah, yeah. that's just an overall, no, overall thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but for me, it's just like me being a cis head man, I've, I've literally never had to think about it. Right. Exactly. And, uh, and, that's, and that's exactly. like that's like and me saying holy shit is like fuck that's part of the problem. Right. You know and and I mean? like I said, and overall that's how we feed transphobia, right? Because you don't have to think about it. Right. You don't have to think about getting from from uh, your house to a bus or then the a car about, right or <laughs> to the subway. Right. Okay? And then what I often tell people is with with trans people, you can't just worry about when they leave the house. Like you have to think about what's going on in their homes. And you have to also think about what's going on when they don't have a home. And you have to think about like some of the other added layers. And so it's easy for us to start at a point that they aren't at. And I think oftentimes in this work, we start at points that some people ain't at. And I think that happens a lot of times with people who are claiming to want to help trans mm-hmm. people is that they're starting from a place where they ain't at, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, and it's kind of like you said, we have the Black Travel Fund. It's like, well, that's dope, but like, 
where's like that first part, right? Like mm -hmm. the black, where do I live? <laughs> like, the black, you know, and so I think that's very important. I'm glad you brought it up because I would love to figure out a way to pull resources yes, and start to create something yes. different. Um, and I would love to see what it looks like if we created people who aren't trans start creating systems for people yes. who are trans. Not to run them for them, but to run them and then allow them to run them. Leverage resources. Exactly. So it's great that George brought up so many great points. One thing I wanted to ask Julius, because it goes straight into what I wanted to ask you. Um, the perception of being with your cousin, and it speaks so much as a trans person, it speaks so much to how the world sees trans people. When you think about even, we can take it into race, sometimes you can use race as a way to help kind of get people to see. And it's just like white people, they don't want to go out with a black person because all the perception is being a black person. So then it's just like your parent, when you come out as gay or you come out as trans, their reaction to it is often visceral because they know the world's going to be that way to you. So what I wanted to have, exactly, or to them because they had you, or, or even in proximity with you, yes. right? So what I wanted to ask you is it, it segues straight into it because you 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 disclose and we're very vulnerable. Let us know that hey, I got called out, nigga, like straight up, and I have called out. Uh, I have a little account, you know, where you know. You <laughs> and I, account, huh? I didn't understand because <laughs> you know I got twenty followers on the real one. So <laughs> I have an account where I do go to like I like watching cis men with the boys. That's what I like to see in porn, right? I'll subscribe to OnlyFans with that. Why aren't you calling them? And then, let's keep it further, there is one of the guys, a cis head dude that does porn, he's big, and he does call the guys, but it's majority white it's guys. Like guys. And he's predatory. I learned he pays the guys low dollar. <laughs> he plays the guys low dollar, lower than he pays any other demographic. So, my question to you, is if you could vulnerably share that with us now that you've been called out in that public way and you are in the space of this conversation like what can you personally do to be you know held accountable on this topic and if you don't know that's cool. um uh, that's hard you know, uh i feel like i miss the mark a lot because mm. i don't keep up with the lingo or i'm i i do not i'm learning what trans is from trans men that are figuring out themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to, for me to even get a perspective of what the culture is. Okay, for, for instance, um, there was a politician in Detroit that was literally taking money from the school fund and giving it to younger boys for clothes. Like there was just a bunch of gay guys that were like feeding off of him. Mm -hmm. um, just like, they called themselves the diesel. It was like, mm -hmm. they all were diesel. Mm -hmm. um, but when you saw diesel, because we none of us could, could afford it, you knew who you feel me? So it felt pimpish, right? That's what right. pimps did. Put the tattoo on the hand, you know what I'm saying? So um, it was it wasn't until he fled to Seattle so that I realized that that was wrong. Because I thought they were getting money. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I, thought, I was like, oh, that was dope. Like they're mm -hmm. getting money for for what they want to do. But that was out there. <laughs> these were 14 year old boys. Right. You know what I'm saying? And he right. was a 40 year old man. Right, right. But they were my friends. I thought they were okay until the news came out and it wasn't. Right, so right. I felt like I contributed to it because I felt like that was the culture. Right, right. And really it was like, no, nah, they're being taken advantage of. You right, know what I'm saying? Right, right. Um, and then the same thing with uh, moving to Vegas. Uh, they have this group of clubs called the Fruit Loop. And it's just a bunch of gay bars together. Mm -hmm. But my cousin, who is a gay man. I'm sorry, that is a genius fucking thing for, <laughs> a, for a system of life. Like, like, like that is a, that, <laughs> Favorite place Fucking game. genius. I love that. I've been to Verona, by the way. But, <laughs> um, it is his pastime is to sit in the casual seat and just say fag all the time to trans men. So you'll see a trans man walking like with heels going into the club. So let me stop you here because I thought this was happening and we'll have this moment now. And it's okay. And I want you to know this is coming from a place of love. For sure. We'll have a, a quick moment. So I am formally identified as a trans man. So what that means is, when I came out, they said I'm female. And then I came to a point where I was like, eh, that ain't for me. So well, I hear you, yes, and now I identify more towards the spectrum of male, not completely. 
I'm just, I'm a being. I don't identify with none of that shit. I'm like Prince, bitch. You don't know what the fuck I am. Mind your business. You get the genitals when you get a piece. So, so, I, I just want to come back because for our, our listeners, there has been a conflation. You're talking about trans women. Because if they have on, and this is an assumption also, if they have on heels, I'm thinking what you're talking about is trans women. Yeah. Somebody who was born into the world and and they were told how they were and how they were supposed to be, and they met a point where they said, I'm a woman. So that's okay, so we, we just met a learning point. Right. So one thing is always remember like, and also everybody's different, right? Like, I don't identify as a trans man anymore, or right now in this moment, tomorrow I might, today I don't. So, yeah. <laughs> so again, look, the sister people be like, oh God, you're confusion. <laughs> <laughs> They, for me, I get to pick my gender. Like people pick their draws. I'm like, bitch, you got one gender heel. You're gonna you sound like Mr. B. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I did this. So, so pretty much to, to, to bring it back. So pretty much, that's just an understanding. Like who you're referring to is the girls. Like for me, I would say the girls. Because more times than not, if you see somebody like that, they could be CD truck cross dresser. They could be drag. You don't know. Like we're also it, there's also an assumption of trans. So that was a moment that I appreciate because before I wanted to say something, but I was like, no, because you're a sex worker and I know the boys work with the boys, so maybe you are using it properly. And then before I was like, you know what? Let me just say something real quick because it was a moment for our users and our listeners and our watchers to know that it's okay. Like, you see, I ain't bite your neck off. It didn't turn into like the green screen and they're like, ah, like, like I'm just letting you know, bro. Like that was the term and we gonna use this. And also, I'll be real, that came from a place of love because I'm fucking with you and I know you. If I didn't know you, that would have probably went down completely different. Which is scary as fuck. Exactly. <laughs> to have an interaction with somebody and, and try to say something, it's like, no. Because I feel like when he was saying this, it felt like like uh, white people saying the word nigga, you know what I'm saying? So I felt like dirty. Like, why do you keep saying that out the window, you know what I'm saying? Um, so I just don't. That's why you to interact with people. Because that shows how the word fag is used towards trans women in a way where a lot of time it don't get talked about. And like a lot of time when the girls use that word, they're like, ah, oh my God, use that slur. And they like, bitch, because that's what I can call every day. Like, you don't know what my life is. So um, I guess I just kind of wanted to bring that into now we're talking about slurs and uses of slurs and stuff like that, and like violence people face. I kind of want to bring that into like, I want everybody to let us know what tangible thing can you personally and also your mans them around you do to shift this part of culture? So I think, uh, well, uh, a point I was going to bring up before I gave Blake the floor was uh, uh, three things is um, nothing, nothing that I'm about to say is an excuse for any of my past like transphobia or shitty behavior. Um, atonement is not supposed to be easy. Like you don't just say sorry once and then it, and then the whole world forgives you. And the third thing is that nobody owes me forgiveness for anything. Mm -hmm. So like something that I may think is not that big a deal means the fucking world to like a trans person or whatever. You know what I mean? So like it's never for me personally. This is me being totally honest. It's never gotten to a point where I have been violent to a trans person. Like, that is not me, that has never been me. But, grow, again, not an excuse, but growing up, you know what I'm saying, in the South Bronx, on the concourse, like, all over the Bronx, all Webster, going to school, going to Taft, like, it's, you, when you hear that shit every day, and you around, like, you around young men who are raised similarly. Hearing what? Hearing the T word, hearing the F word, you know what I'm saying, like, you hear that shit, and like, it's it's almost it's almost like it's like you know in our young minds it's almost like like we like we we had solidarity kind of mm. in our own circle of like mm. hate yes and it was fucking like and, and thinking it was violent and like thinking, <laughs> thinking on that shit is like really like like it's like weird like that we just thought that shit was cool because. Mm -hmm past generations have said that shit around us mm -hmm. so like nobody checked them on it and then no one went and checked us on it 
for, for me personally, no one went and checked me on it until way later. And then, like you said, like you've brought up a couple times, I think in a couple episodes, that whether you know it or not, you have interacted with a trans person. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the way, there's, there's this concept of like intention versus impact. And like, even if, even uh, the way a lot of non-black people like to justify using the N-word is that, oh no, nah, but it's different when I say it. <laughs> Like it's different when we say it, you know what I mean? Like, like yo, you, you mind whatever, like, like you know what I'm saying? Like I know, I, like we in the same boat or whatever, you right. know? And it's like, nah, not everybody has to feel that way. Like it's the same, like with the, with the, like with the F word, but like, you know, I mean, he's a piece of shit, but like Louis C.K. tried to play it off, where it's like, like on stage, he was like, oh, I don't, you know. I don't say it because you are gay or because you are whatever. I say it because you're being an F word, and it's like, you know, you tried to make it funny or whatever, and like you had you had the room, you know what I'm saying? But like, it's still not everybody's gonna share that, and it's kind of fucked up of you as a straight white guy to try and own that and try and like and try and like take the the the, the pain away from that from those statements, mm -hmm. which then justified my like my younger like self or whatever, even before the Louis C.K. thing, that mindset justified my use of those violent terms. Mm -hmm. So like growing up, meeting more openly trans people, mm -hmm. meeting more openly black trans women specifically, like the, the tangible thing that I'm doing is me actively combating my transphobic past. Mm -hmm. So like given the, I'm sorry, can I say the girls? I mean, I say the girls. The, we, the girls will let us know if they don't like okay. it once they watch this. Okay, cool. We so, can get red. <laughs> so, Pierre's like secondhand embarrassment over here. Damn. I'm just lying. Yeah, I said, damn, what the fuck? Right, the so, girls is just an easy way to say it. Like, no, okay. no. So, so, me giving the girls like money mm -hmm. and like mm -hmm. showing up for them financially. Mm -hmm. It's like I can't always be there in person, you know what I'm saying? Like I got a job and kids and shit. Right. So like doing what I can for them financially or whatever, like right. in any case, right? That's how I actively combat my past. But again, it's not an excuse for any of it. Atonement's not supposed to be easy, and no one owes me forgiveness. Yeah. So for the littlest shit. So right. like that I that sorry, that I consider to be, oh, I just said this shit in high school. It's like somebody could be like, yo, but that shit's hurtful. Whether you like it or not. Yeah, right. so, so that's how I've contributed to, to like transphobia. As far as contributing or what I would like to do? Like, I, I'm thinking about like what tangible things can uh, men do, like a message to people, and yeah. then also like what tangible things, like I don't know what you practice, what you do. Yeah, I think um, anytime I think about like being in solidarity or advocacy for somebody, the number one thing is like listening to what they need. Um, and I think like through this conversation and uh, just talk about that with trans folks. Like the number one thing I want to do is give a lot more money than I'm giving right now. Yes. I think that's like the number one thing. Uh, and then like building community with trans folks like directly in my community and abroad. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that, that's another one. And then continue to educate myself and my community on transphobia. Uh, those are like some of the, I think the, the biggest changes. Or, like some of the, these are things I'm already doing, but I think they can just be again, we talk about the bar being floor and like, these are shit that I need to be like amplifying a lot more. Yo, I got a black trans man in, um, out there in California, no no cap, bro. He helped change the rules for um, trans men in prison. He's formerly incarcerated, and he wants to do a housing program. I will directly link y'all with him, because I'm all the way out here. Right. What I'm going to do. So if y'all help him, bro, I'm dead ass. I'll link y'all with him. If people really want to get about it, about it, he wants to start a housing thing. Hold on, just like you read me, yeah. you know what you can do? You can fly your ass out there and do something. Right. How about I will, that? I will. How about that? Actually, I work for TGIJ. TG, if you want to know, I work for Transgender, Gender, Parent, Intersect Justice Project out in California. So if you want to know, so let's, let's do this, baby, because I've done it. Oh, I'm international, baby. So, that, so that's really dope. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to let us know. I don't know, you know, Pierre. I don't know if there's anybody else. Because you had said in another episode about providing free services. So that made me wonder, Do uh, by any chance, do you work in a network of providers who help provide free or even like pay scale services to trans people or something, or black trans people or something? I know. I mean, 
if any, I guess I, I know of um, one person, um, Magnolia Help, mm -hmm. um, who is giving a uh, free uh, therapy to Shout out to her. Yes. yes. Okay. I heard she, she knows she fan. So yes. That's a shout out to her. Yes. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know what I'm fucking saying. <laughs> I, the practice of psychotherapy is very selfish. And people don't go into private practice to help people. Um, you know, a lot of the a, a, a lot of the people in these counseling and applied psychology and even social work programs, the people who have the means and have the money, they want their private practice below Midtown or Midtown and below, where they service people who look just like them, who can take their insurance, who can cross their shields. And you know, that whole thing, they're not really looking to provide free services. To be honest, when I first um, decided to get into therapy to provide free services to every black person that I could, which right now would just be in New York, um, when I came up with this idea and I started thinking about how can I make this real life, um, I got a lot of roadblocks and a lot of challenges and then also a lot of praise that I don't feel like I deserve because it seems like a very easy basic problem that more people should be doing. Mm -hmm. Like why aren't therapists providing free therapy mm -hmm. to the people who need it in their communities? Like I'm not doing anything. I don't feel like I'm smarter than anyone else. I don't feel like I'm more whatever. It's just that the profession and society teaches people to be selfish. So I, for me, this is more of a call out to the black therapists in our community but only if you are coming from a systemic oppression where harm reduction, queer friendly, trans friendly, mm -hmm. have searched through your own shit, have done your own work, won't bring like um, organized religion into everything, won't bring your own like biases into everything. Like the kind of therapists our community needs, because I'm calling it out, a lot of black therapists are really conservative. Mm. And a lot of black therapists are really religious and you're harming your own community because they're not coming to you for a reason. There's a reason why black people aren't coming through your doors. So acknowledge that and become more open because you're needed. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of these black people are seeing clients that don't look like them and wasting their resources mm -hmm. when they could grow and be something more. So for me, what I, the tangible things I try to do is whenever I have some extra um, or money, um, I, I try to donate that when I can. And also working towards the, this, this practice I'm opening up. So I can provide uh, free therapy to the low income people who need it the most, which coincidentally is, tends to be um, trans people. Right. Specifically like black trans people, black trans and queer people. And it's like, and I'm also going to call out to the other, uh, not just therapists, but if you have a professional skill, why aren't you providing some pro bono work? Right. That's what y'all could be doing for trans people. Not all of us have money, and I hear that, because shit's hard out there, the economy sucks, white people take in everything. But you have skills, even if it's like help them write a resume, or a, a cover letter, or buy interview clothes for them, or teach them how to dress, because low key, Mm -hmm. uh, trans people first starting out, you know, they learn and they learn it. So maybe people need to learn how to match clothes, yeah. or like what's the right things to buy, or like help them go shopping. Maybe walk them into the women's section or into the men's section and guard them while they try on clothes and buy clothes. Mm -hmm. That's another thing that y'all be doing. Or going like shopping, or going like wig shopping. Mm -hmm. Like I, it's something that I I used to do. Um, way back when is I would go clothes shopping and like wig shopping and just stand there. Mm -hmm. Like you know, you know, just to make sure that no one rolls up on them. Mm -hmm. So that's something else that's not monetary, you know, you should be giving money. But that's something mm -hmm. non monetary you could be doing. You know, or that I could be doing more. For me I guess just the like driver home, I just wanna um let it be known that the the, the ways that I wanna let people know um to provide like solidarity and material support is Start a fund in your local spot, bro. Like housing, we talk, we gonna link up. That's gonna happen. Start a fund, 
Like, reach out to Black Trans Travel Fund and figure out how to start it in your spot. Reach out to Black Trans Media to, fi to find out how you can continue doing mutual aid support. I'm gonna link you with some, like, you know what I'm saying, Black Trans, like, sex workers or whatever, so you can get that, like, like reach out, you know, reach out and take that step out of your comfort zone and kind of just know that it's okay to be scared, it's okay to be called out, you're gonna be all right. At the end of the day, this is over people's lives, so that's that's just the part I wanted to put out there. Give your money to the people. I have a friend who's trans and um, she literally sends me, every time she's raising money for um, a trans person, she direct messages me mm -hmm. um, just to make sure that I see it and that I retweet it. Did you see For the Girls? No. For the Girls is, uh, just real quick, I know we're done. For the Girls is happening here in New York City and they throw house parties and it's to pay black trans people's rent. It's not just For the Girls, it's just called For the Girls. And you cannot, you don't have to go to the house party, you can amplify their shit and just help them get donations. So that's something, we don't have to create our own shit. They already got shit, just give so their shit and run it right. So for me, that's, that's become like one of the biggest tools that I use is amplification because I can t like I can see what happens when I don't retweet something versus what can happen when I do retweet something. Mm -hmm. And I remember, and I wanted to make sure I said it because I remember maybe about two weeks ago, she sent me a message and she was like, like I know you're extremely busy, George. Like, does it bother you that I send you all of these things? And she was like, I never asked. I just started sending them to you and you just started amplifying. And I said, well, no, it's not. That's what I'm supposed to do. And I was like, and I know I'm extremely busy, and I know I got to say, I was like, but no, like, don't ever feel like you can't send me stuff to support my own community that I'm not gonna make sure it gets amplified. Mm -hmm. I was like, I appreciate you even being concerned because yes, I do get overwhelmed, I get burdened, but mm -hmm. I think the work of solidarity looks like stepping outside of yourself and realizing you're not the most marginalized person in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, um, even though I deal with intersections of HIV and all kinds of other issues with my queerness and other issues from the world, I'm still not the most marginalized, mm -hmm. in my opinion, in the opinions of most. In fact, you know, then this particular group of people and uh, that's what solidarity has to look like. Man. <laughs> <laughs>that conversation was dope as hell to have just amongst you know a variety of different identities i think it's very rare for those conversations to be having you know like you had straight black men you feel me you had black queer folks black trans folks all together in one room you feel me um talking about solidarity with the trans community and i think it's super important for us to to be about that action and to show up especially as a black straight man to show up and learn from black trans folks, you feel me, black queer folks, and take the knowledge that I've learned and educate, you feel me, other black straight men. So the the burden isn't always on the people experiencing the most oppression. Something that came up on the episode was like straight black men, I guess in terms of solidarity, like the bar being the floor for us, like we get um, commended for doing the bare minimum in terms of solidarity for folks that don't identify as um, straight black men. So. Yeah, I thought it was dope to be like challenged um, and I felt like I left that episode with a deeper understanding of how I can actually um, continue to be in solidarity with black China folks. I think one thing I took away from this conversation is admitting like my previous, you know, transphobia and always being willing to work on, you know, my transphobic thoughts that I've had in the past, right? And admitting that because I think it's important for us to admit that we've grown, you feel me? So like other people can grow too, you know? So I think having that honest conversation I think it's super important. super important. Niggas need to pay up and give more money to folks. Put your money where your mouth is. Put your money where your solidarity is. Start to think about the ways that you, you know, um, contribute to transphobia, the ways in which you can continue, you can better be in solidarity with black trans folks. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm doing. So I encourage others to do that. Just really like take a step back and reflect on reflect on those things, how you contributing to transphobia and what you can do to be in better solidarity with black trans folks. The first thing from discourse is really taking everything you learned and not letting that just leave there. You feel me? It's like that conversation that we had. If you learned something, you gotta tell somebody about that conversation. You should t definitely tell them about discourse and whatnot, of course, but I think what you learned is what's most important. And taking that to your friend, your partner, your cousin, your auntie, and having those same conversations, I think we can make a lot of changes through conversations and through political education, especially if we all want to be free from this white supremacist capitalist patriarchal society.